Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. For today's video, we're gonna be taking a short break from the Compact Desk Pro series, and we're gonna be looking at something that I do love, and I know a lot of you guys do too, Commodore 64. In this main board is a very butchered and damaged Commodore 64 main board that I got from my friend Brian. He's had this board for over a year and hasn't been able to get it working. When he got it, it was sold as not working and had already had a lot of reworked and butchering done to it. He tried to fix it and was unsuccessful, so he passed it on to me and asked me if I could get it working for him. So let's get right to it. This Commodore 64 board is super abused and it looks like it's just had so much stuff done to it in the past. So many of the chips are in sockets and that's just a bad sign because when you don't know what you're doing, removing a chip can easily rip traces under them. Notice there's just tons of sockets all over this board, but other chips that were clearly reworked were just put back on the motherboard without a socket. It doesn't really make sense and it makes troubleshooting so hard. This is the revision of C64 that I love because of the sharp video output. It has the 8701 chip, but check out this strange corrosion on the board. I wonder what that's all about. The little metal panel on the side around the ports is just bent and so beat to hell. I wonder what happened to this poor thing. On the bottom of the board, especially on the power RF section, things look okay, but over by the chips, whoa, it's very brown and there's a whole bunch of wires where things have been bodged already, obviously due to lifted traces. There's tons of flux all over the place. You could just tell this has had some bad quality rework done at some point in its life. Next, I wanna test the voltage regulators on this motherboard. Before I do that though, I wanna remove all the sensitive MOS chips. There is two reasons for this. One is that the chips might be bad and bring the voltage rails down, but also if a voltage regulator is screwed up, it might send too much voltage into one of these chips and damage it. I'm also gonna test all of these chips in another machine just to eliminate them as a problem. All right, let's plug in power and grab the multimeter. We're gonna start testing the voltage regulators. This one here gives me 12 volts and I'm getting that. And the other one is five volts. And that's also what I'm getting, which is great. I'm checking the voltage on one of the RAM chip sockets as well. And I'm also getting a nice five volts, which is a good sign. So we have a pile of chips that I took out of the board. I wanna test these in my C64 with ZIF sockets. The zero insertion force sockets on this machine allow for a very easy testing of lots of chips. First thing I like to do with this machine when I start to use it is give it a test on its own just to make sure that it's working because I don't want to be testing chips in a machine that's bad. Here's my diagnostic test cartridge. It has both dead test and the regular C64 test on it. I'm going to use the regular one with Sven's nice diagnostic test harness he sent me. This will make sure this machine is working perfectly before I insert any of the chips from the other board just to make sure we have a known common denominator of a working machine. It plugs into all the various ports on the machine, including the controller ports, just to make sure everything is working. We power it up and everything should say okay on this test screen. Nothing should say bad. First, we're gonna take out my MSI VIC-2. Well, actually it's just a heat sink and stick in the one from the other board. And we're gonna make sure that it comes up with a good screen. And it does, that's excellent. Now, one by one, I'm gonna test all the chips, including all the RAM chips I was able to remove from the other board. All the chips, including the RAM, tested perfect in my machine. So let's move on to checking out the traces on this motherboard. I grabbed my multimeter, set it to continuity, and let's flip this over and start checking out these traces. I'm gonna start by looking at the RAM chips. Those were taken off, and that's most likely where there's a damaged trace. As we can see, there's already three bodge wires. So to test this, 
we just start checking the continuity between all of the pins on each of the chips. Almost all of the pins are common across all RAM chips, except for the two data lines. You need to check your schematics for your particular C64 mainboard, but usually pins 2 and 14 are the two that are bespoke and go off to different areas of the board, while the rest are common on all of the chips. All of them need to have full continuity between everything, or it's going to have a problem and not work. This is a simple test and should only take you a few minutes to do all of the pins. In my testing, I ended up finding a rip trace right here between these two RAM chips. I also found on this socket down here that there was no power or ground going to the ground and power pins, which is weird because the pins aren't broken on it. So first things first, let's put a bodge wire and fix this broken trace here. On the back of the board, let's just draw a mark where I need to connect the bodge wire between the two pins. I'm going to be using a solid core wire wrap wire to do the repair. I've used this in a bunch of my projects. You just need a fine tip soldering iron and you just solder it on between the two pins. You might need some tweezers because the wire is very fine and very fiddly. If you want to be thorough on your repair, put a little drop of epoxy or glue on the wire wrap wire to keep it from ever moving in the future. Check your work with Continuity Tester when you're done. It's now time to use the dead test cartridge on this board. I'm going to have to reinstall chips, but I noticed that the CPU socket is actually installed upside down. The notch is on the wrong side. There is a silkscreen mark on the motherboard to tell you the correct orientation, so make sure you check that before you just blindly put the chips in. At the minimum, I'm going to need a CPU, a PLA, and the VIC-2 chip to get the dead test working. Oh, and on this computer, I'm going to need the 8701 clock generator chip as well. I'm going to install all the RAM chips I removed. Even though I know one of the sockets has no ground or 5 volts on it, it's still going to be a good test to see if dead test flashes and tells me which chip is bad. With the cartridge in, let's power it up. And we're just getting a white line on the left side, which means that the video signal is being output, so I know the RF modulator is working, but we're not even getting any flashing. This just appears totally dead. So let's take a close look at the board. There's got to be some other issues with it. A lot of these solder joints on these rework chips look really crappy. I'm going to reflow them, which will hopefully fix the bad RAM chip power lines as well, but then should fix any of the other intermittent connections if there are any. And yes, reflowing the solder on that one bad RAM socket did fix the ground and 5 volts to it. Unfortunately, with my dejected look here, powering up with a dead test, it still results in just a plain black screen. So there's definitely more wrong with this computer. Let's get started with more troubleshooting. I have my oscilloscope on the bench. I have my logic probe and I have the power connected to the C64. I have the schematics for this board up on the screen here just to help me. So we verified that all the MOS chips are good. The RAM chips that are socketed are good. I tested all the traces on the RAM and I fixed a couple of those that were bad. And all that's left is the 74 logic chips which are socketed. Although Brian, whose board this is, says that these chips all tested good. So I'm just going to assume that they are fine. The voltages look good and I think the next thing I want to test is for the reset signal. And there's a 556 timer right here and that generates the reset signal that holds the computer in reset when you power it on and then releases. According to the schematics, the reset signal comes out of pin 9 on the 556 and then goes into this 7406 and is buffered and comes out of pin 8. So with the logic probe on pin 8, when I turn the power on, it should be low for a little while and then go high. I right, turn this on and you'll be able to hear it by the beep. So that went from low to high, which is exactly what it should do. So the reset signal is working fine. Next we have the 8701. This is the clock generator chip. And this has a couple clock outputs. Pin six on this chip is dot clock and pin eight is actually the color clock. So this is pin eight on the 8701 and we're getting 14.310 megahertz, which is perfect. That is the color clock. And then this is pin six which is 8.18 megahertz, which is the dot clock. And that looks perfect as well. Now let's take a look at pin one on the CPU, which is the CPU clock. And I'm getting 1.022 megahertz. So the CPU is getting a correct clock. All right, back to the logic probe. I'm gonna check each of the data lines on the RAM chips. 
So on each RAM chip on pin two and also 14 is the data line. There is one RAM chip per data bit. So of course this is an eight bit computer. So there are eight RAM chips. Each one handles a single bit. So I'm gonna to expect to hear beeping and not just a, a solid tone on each of these on pin two. That's good. That's just a solid tone on this RAM chip. Beeping is good. That's good. Good. That's good. That's good. So RAM chip two here, which is not in a socket, we just have a solid tone. Let's see how RAM chips two data line looks on the oscilloscope. My oscilloscope, I have it set for one volts per division. So when you have five volts, it's up near the top here. And when we look at chip two, we have pulses, but we're only getting a little bit over a volt peak to peak. So something is bringing the data bus down. Now it could be this RAM chip, it could be something else on here. The second data bit is connected to various things on the motherboard, including these ROM chips. But I know the ROM chips are fine because those are working. So it's gotta be something else that's on that shared data bus. Other things that share the data bus are the VIC-2, but we know that's fine. PLA and of course the SID, but those are fine. Also sharing though is U16 here, which is a MOS 4066. The schematics show that bits zero, one, two, and three are all connected to this chip. And when I look at pin one, I'm seeing that same low voltage thing going on. So obviously that's data bit two hooked up to this, but which chip is bad? Is it the 4066 or is it DRAM chip? Now there's a few things we can do here. I can obviously remove those chips, see which one has failed, but I can also cut legs on them. And if I snip one leg, it's easy to re-solder that leg back on again if that wasn't actually the problem. So I am going to snip the single leg on this 4066 here. So the leg is snipped and let's power this back up and check with the oscilloscope what we see on data bit two. The voltage is still very low on the second data bit. So I don't think it was that chip. I'm just gonna blob that back together with the soldering iron. And what I'm gonna do now is heat up the desoldering iron and remove this RAM chip. So I marked red here on the chip that's gonna be removed and notice that has a bunch of bodge wires. Clearly someone had removed that chip and put a new one on, I guess, without putting a socket on. If you haven't seen me use this technique before, I have a video or I show it, it's my way of doing it without lifting traces. All right, while the board is hot, I'm gonna use this opportunity to clean up this mess. With the chip out, it's really easy to clean up the holes. All right, let's clean this up. Here's messy flex residue off of this thing. New socket. Okay, so these bodge wires are just sort of sitting off to the side here. Let's see if these are actually connected or not. So these two are connected here, but there is a break over here on this socket where this purple wire is here. That's, that's broken. And let's test this one. Sure enough, that's broken as well. I'm just gonna take these off. These are, these are crap wires and we'll put on new thin bodge wires. The pad is totally lifted on this one here. It's just missing altogether. All right, let's see if this is working now. All right, bodges reinstalled. So let's install the dead test back into the 64 and let's turn this on. I have the RAM chip missing and we should get flashing. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, if this RAM chip were bad and that were the only thing that were bad, this one right here, then with the dead test in there, we should get flashing to tell us that that particular RAM chip is bad. 
So there's got to be another fault on this machine, but I'm going to install a known good RAM chip into here and just see if what changes. Put a RAM chip in from my test machine, pull the diagnostic cartridge out and turn this on. Not really expecting it to work. And yes, sure enough, it's not working. Okay, so let's check the oscilloscope. So there is data line two, which is looking good now. No more crap on it. There's that RAM chip. Let's go through all the RAM chips. That looks good. That looks good. Okay, so at least all the data lines are proper voltages now. Nothing is held into an unusual state. Let's check the pin on the 4066. Yep, that's looking good as well. This is the one I cut earlier and re-soldered. Okay, some interesting progress, and I'm not sure what's going on. Right here on the motherboard is the color RAM. This is a static RAM chip. It's used to hold the color information for the computer. This is connected to the data bus through this 4066, and it also talks to the VIC-2 chip. When I was probing around with the multimeter, I noticed that one of the data bit lines, this pin right here, just looked very strange. The signal didn't look normal. It didn't look like the other signals look, the other three bits that are on here. So what I did is I took this VIC out, which I know this VIC works, and I lifted and I bent out the pin for that data bit line, put it back in, and I tested again. And when I did, it looked the same, it looked screwed up. Something, something was wrong. So it was leading me to believe it was one of these two chips. Neither of them are in sockets. And let's turn on the computer. And would you look at that? We're getting something that looks different than what we've been getting before. Let's power cycle it again. It kind of randomly does different things now. So we're getting a black screen now. Turn it off, turn it on. Look, now we're getting flashing, and we're getting three flashes. The fact that we're getting flashes indicates that the CPU is actually running, well, at least some of the time, and it's able to run enough that the dead test is able to give that three flashes in white. Although, look, now we're not, we're not getting anything. Let's check out that data bit pin here. So there's the data bit line that I was seeing the weirdness on, and if we look at the other ones that are near it, like that, I figure that's how it should look. This is one of the other data bit lines. So is this here, that looks normal. One volt per division, so five volts there. And that one, those are the four data bits that are on this two 114 SRAM chips. But this, that doesn't look, that doesn't look normal. But something that's weird is when I power cycle the computer and we actually get the flashing, see if I can get it to do it again, that, that signal line looks normal. See, that looks a bit different. Look, what's happening there? Whoa, look at that. We actually have some picture here, but the colors are all screwed up. And that would imply either a PLA problem or the color RAM is messed up. Could also be the 4066 that connects the color RAM to the VIC-2 chip. But I know for sure this VIC-2 chip is working fine. I know the PLA is working because this could be a PLA problem too and I know the CPU is working. So it's gotta be either the color RAM or the 4066. Now I've had a lot of trouble with 2114 chips in the past, especially on my pets, because it uses those for the video RAM, lots of issues. But I'm gonna assume it is the color RAM that's the problem. I'd say that this color RAM isn't necessarily the original one. There's a lot of solder around it there. It looks like it's been replaced at some point. Meanwhile, the 4066 here looks original. I don't see any re evidence of rework. So I'm gonna pull this color RAM out of here. This could be like a cheap Chinese replacement or something. And let's pop in a different one. So I'm really bummed out. My TS100 soldering iron broke. What happened is uh, this part of the case cracked and uh, now the power connector is flaky. I guess too much stress plugging and unplugging this all the time. I don't know. It's, I'll take this apart and try to fix it. But right now this thing's out of commission. It started kind of just cutting out randomly when I was using it and now it, doesn't work at all. So I took out the color RAM chip and I've installed a new socket right there. So let's power this up with this chip removed and I wanna see what that signal looks like without the SRAM. Obviously it's not gonna work without that, but let's see what happens. Okay, we're getting a single flash. Okay, so there's the signal that was looking screwed up before. Let's turn it off and on. Probably just not gonna work correctly because it's not loaded down with the SRAM chip. Yeah, things just look weird right now without the chip in there. So let me find another uh, SRAM chip and populate that, see how that changes things. 
All right, dug through my parts and I found some 2114s in a tube. So let's pop these out. I have no idea where I got these. These could be China Specials. Looks pretty good quality. Doesn't look like it's been repainted. NEC brand. Let's pop this in the motherboard. Here we go. All right, still flashing one. Let's try that again. I did test, at least it immediately flashes. Just one flash and then stops. So something's still very wrong. Maybe there was nothing wrong with this chip and it's this uh, 4066 instead. At least it's consistently flashing every time as before it was just immediately crapping out. This could be a red herring that normally tells you which RAM chip is bad, but if it keeps jumping around to different RAM chips, it could easily be another chip on the board that's sort of pointing you towards bad RAM. All right, well, let's check out what the signals look like. Yeah, look, it still looks very weird, that pin on there. That looks normal. That looks wrong. So I think this 2114 was fine, and it's something else that's wrong. And I'm going to guess that it might be this 4066. So time to take that out now. Oh, and guess what? So this is the 4066 that's acting up. Well, I think might be acting up and looking at the back. This this chip has definitely been reworked. This has been resoldered. The one next to it, this one right here, this one has never been touched. This has an 84 date code. This one is a Oki part, has a strange date code 0987, ninth week of 87. That's suspect to me. All right, let's pop that out. Okay, so 4066 is replaced. That's this one. I put a new one in. I put the original SRAM chip back in. So it's in a socket now. It's kind of nice. Let's see what happens when we turn this thing on now. All right, we got flashing. Let's check with the oscilloscope what those problematic sing signals look like. This is the one. This was the one that was all screwed up looking. And you know what? It absolutely looks completely fine now. That was the one that had that weird pattern on it. All right, good, everything looks normal. So we're still getting flashing, but at least that signal looks correct. So 4066 definitely was bad. So I've looked up the flash codes on my phone here. I'm still not convinced it's the RAM. So it's flashing one. That says that's U12. U12 is one of the chips that I've actually tested and I know works fine. If we see other flash codes, okay, now we're getting four which is U23, which is a totally different chip. I have some known good RAM chips I just took out of my test machine. Let's change U12 just for fun. Oh, U12 has really short legs. So maybe it's not making good contact with the socket. Who knows? There's U12 replaced. I know that chip is good. So if we turn this on and it flashes one, it's flashing one, which is definitely U12 on this motherboard. And I know this chip for 100% this chip is working properly. So there is something else wrong on this board we're gonna have to find. So something I've run into before is the PLA. This is a good PLA. This socket maybe isn't good. Maybe there's a problem with the connectivity to this PLA and it causes all sorts of issues with the dead test with telling you you have bad RAM when you don't. Let's pop the PLA out and I wanna see what kind of socket yeah, the PLA has a single wipe socket, so I'm just gonna hit it with some deoxit for fun. Let's pop the PLA back in just to see, just for kicks and giggles. No change. All right, to recap, dead test flashes random number of flashes showing different RAM chips are bad, but I took the RAM chip that it said was bad out, put it in my other test bench machine, and it works perfectly. So I know that's a lie. It's got to be one of these chips here that's causing a problem. Now, I'd normally say the PLA is the issue that causes flashing issues like that, but I took the PLA out, put it in the other machine, and it works. I deoxid this socket, no change, right? I really feel like one of these RAM problems are going to be these chips here. The RAM is there, and these are kind of address bus multiplexers. This got to be causing an issue. And if we pop these out, they certainly come out of the sockets really easily. Now, again, like I said, Brian had said that these chips had been tested beforehand and they tested good and he did that in a mini pro. So I'm not going to retest these. But one thing I notice is this socket here. This is a piece of crap socket. I hate these. The chip that's in here has mangled legs that look like they were desoldered and they're shorter than they should be. 
And I always find that these types of sockets do not work well unless the chip is in pristine shape. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna hit this with some deoxid, help the chips go in there a little smoother. And then this is that really crappy socket. Just give it a good shove down. And keep in mind, you notice that this machine has no ROMs, no SID, and no CIA chips. And that's actually fine. You don't need those to run dead test. Let's turn this on, see what happens. Hmm. Oh. Oh my God. There we go. It's working. Look at that. So there you have it. Flaky sockets. I just reseated those with deoxid, gave them a good shove and push, and now it's working. So I've gone ahead and repopulated all the chips with the three ROMs, two CIAs, and actually the SID chip as well. This is the one Brian gave me with this board. Let's turn this on, see if this goes into basic. Oh, interesting. So it's working, but the character ROM is not making good contact. The letters are screwed up. Take a look at this. <laughs> I would say that's a character ROM issue. Perhaps, it could be still one of these other ICs. Let me push on the character ROM. That doesn't change anything. Let me push on these other ICs here. Restart the power here. Same thing. Well, that looks very much like a character ROM problem. I pull out the character ROM, which no pins are bent. I turn this on, we should just have a blue screen. Yeah, okay, that's what happens when you don't have the character ROM installed. Now, fortunately, the character ROM socket is a piece of crap socket, just like the one we saw down there. So let me try deoxid. And I know this character ROM is good. It works fine in my machine. Same thing. It looks all corrupted. The okay, keyboard is hooked up. And I am able to type. It's just the letters are all screwed up. All right, putting the diagnostic cartridge back in. So it's successfully running the regular diagnostics, although, you know, the graphical corruption is still there, but everything else is testing absolutely fine. So it might be time to check out the C64 Pictorial Fault Guide. This website I found to be invaluable. You just check the pictures here and it kind of gives you an idea of where you might need to look. Okay, here's one that looks like it is it's very similar, U25. Look at the letters there, all kind of screwy and the uh, colors are looking a little weird, things like that. So that could be U25. Oh, wait a second, this one really looks like what we're experiencing. And that's uh, U26. And which chip is U26? This one right here, 74LS373. It's that really horrible socket with the chip. It's got the shortened legs. So I have a brand new chip here, which has full long legs. Let's pop this into the socket, see what that does. Oh, check it out. It's worse, <laughs> it's much worse. Oh, that's pretty hilarious. But you know what, when I push on it, it changes. I'm physically pushing on the chip right now, and look, it's coming and going. I'd say clearly this socket is bad. This is the bottom of the board with that chip there, and. Uh, it, it's terrible. I, I might even see broken solder joints on there. This looks horrible. Reflowing this might actually fix it. I'm gonna put back the original chip here, the one with the cut legs, and let's just see what happens. I mean, I don't expect this to actually work. I'm probably just gonna have to remove that socket altogether. Yep, still not working. Okay, I'm gonna suck that thing out and we're gonna put a whole new socket in there. hate desoldering sockets so much. One thing I do is I cut them in half or into sections, makes it easier to try to desolder them because I can't use my hot air method and because I have this crappy desoldering iron. Okay, so like that one came out. Unfortunately, it looks like one of the pads lifted right there. So I'm gonna have to try to repair that. Should be easy enough. Okay, so I'm looking at what I pulled out here and there's a lifted trace right there. 
I'm not finding that on any of these pieces. That means that probably whoever installed this originally lifted that trace and that's probably why it wasn't quite working. Sorry to break in, but while editing this video, I went back and looked at original footage of the motherboard when I first looked at it. And there is that rip trace right next to the third pin up on the left side. So if I just look carefully at this board originally, I might have noticed that rip trace and been able to fix it, save myself a lot of aggravation. So if you're troubleshooting a board that has evidence that some of the chips have been replaced, you need to pay extra attention to all the traces around those chips and look for potentially broken traces. This could save you a huge headache if you notice those up front and fix them right away. Next, I want to talk about the corrupted character issue. I mentioned that it seemed like there was a problem with the character ROM, but I knew that the ROM was good. I wanted to point out that if I had looked at the schematics to see what connected the character ROM to the VIC-2 chip, I would have seen that U26 sits between the character ROM and the VIC-2. It was pin 8 on the U26 that was ripped, and I have marked in yellow the address line that would have been impacted by this. Even without knowing which address line was bad, if I had checked all the pins on U26 with my oscilloscope, I should have been able to see the problem and identify the fault. This just goes to show how valuable the schematics are in troubleshooting. So not only was this a crap socket, but there was a lifted trace as well. So now I can just heat this up and then lift these pieces out, which um, would be a lot simpler if I actually had a soldering iron that worked. And I wasn't trying to do everything with this giant thing here, but here we go. <laughs> So this is a mess. There's a lifted pad. There's a couple other pads that are screwed up. There's another one that's just missing. It's totally fixable, but what a freaking mess. So I'm gonna take a picture of this while it's off and then I'll put a socket on and then I'll repair the damage based on the picture. Okay, I'm gonna just tone out a few things that look like they're actually damaged on here as well. That's actually still okay. And then this one here goes there. Yeah, so a couple of these are damaged, but I think it'll be okay once we put a socket on there. I'll have to put at least one, but potentially up to three bodge wires on there. So I'm looking at the picture. So this pad is sort of screwed up looking and it goes over here to one of these pins and it talks to that pin right there. So I'm gonna check that. Yeah, that connection is okay and it talks up there, so that's working. So that pad is fine. Let's check about this one next to the U. I'm not actually sure where it goes. It's probably going to something over here, so I'll just test all the pins. Okay, that's talking to that pin without issue, and let's check over here. Okay, so those two are fine. So that pin and that pin are fine. They look really screwy there. Definitely, this one is messed up. I can see this pad here was connecting right there to that via, and it's totally missing. So we're gonna have to add that in on the opposite side. So there's the little bodge repair right there. Goes from the via to that third pin up. So I'm gonna take the ratty original chip that was on this board, and we're gonna put that into this socket. These sockets work a hell of a lot better with chips like that that have already been desoldered from a board. Just gonna brush off any metal shavings that might be left. Just wipe away any debris on the desk. All right, everyone, moment of truth. Connect up the power and the video. Let's turn this on. Well, would you look at that? It's freaking working perfectly now. Yep, fixed. I'm just gonna go give this poor board a little bit of a wash with 99% alcohol over the sink to get all that flux residue off of it. Okay, I have the test harness connected and I'm running some diagnostics. We'll just run a few passes. The cassette port's not working and it said the 6510 is bad. Let me swap the CPU with my other one, see if that makes it better. I think there's some other problem with the board because normally when you turn on the 64, the cassette light comes on briefly on the diagnostic harness and that's not happening. So something that controls the cassette is broken on this board as well. Yeah, and just as I thought, it says bad on the cassette, even with my good CPU. All right, here's the schematics right here for the cassette. 
So it comes out pin 24, it goes through a 1K resistor, it goes through two different transistors, and there's a diode, and this is where the nine volts is basically sent over to pin three on the cassette port adapter here. And on my little thing here, there's an LED that will turn on whenever that signal is nine volts here. So we've got the logic probe. So we're gonna start on the CPU pin 24, and I'm gonna turn this on. Based on what I've seen Commodores, it always comes on and will be probably low, which will activate the cassette motor, and then it will go high after, you know, I don't know, a, few, a second or so. Low, high. Yeah, okay, so that seems normal. Let's check pin three on the cassette port adapter here. When I turn this on, nothing. There's no high, there's no low, there's no nothing on this. So this large transistor here, this is Q1, and this is the main one that outputs to pin three right there. So pin three there should go to the emitter, and that is connected correctly. And then the base on this one, I think should be connected, this is Q4, the other transistor to the emitter, and it is the middle pin of Q4 is going to the base over here. That is directly connected. I think this transistor is bad. The emitter of Q4, which is the pin on the left, is connected to ground, according to schematics, and it is. But then the center pin is also connected to ground at 0.26 ohms. So I'm an electronics novice, but I'm gonna go on a limb and say that the emitter and collector shouldn't be shorted together with zero ohms on this transistor. So I am going to suck this out and we'll put a new one in and get the cassette drive working. So I just tested this transistor out of the board and there was no more short. So that could mean only one thing. When we look at the schematics, the collector and the emitter were both shorted, and that's on ground, and this goes up to nine volts. But if this diode CR2 was shorted to ground, then that would cause a fault as well. And right here is CR2, and now it'll be trivial to test. I'll just take the multimeter and see if this is shorted. Yep, shorted. So it pays to read the schematics. At least I didn't damage this transistor, so I can put that back in without any issue. All right, let's take this diode out of here. I'm gonna reinstall the transistor first. Okay, he's back in his place. So on this diode, there's a little squiggly line on the one side of the arrow, and that indicates that this is a Zener diode. The little squiggle line between a shot key and a Zener is pretty similar, so it's good to not to confuse these two together. Looking at the original schematics, it calls for a 6.8 volt Zener diode, and what's going on here is this regulates the nine volt power supply inside the C64 down to about six volts for the cassette motor. Unfortunately, looking through all my spare parts, I don't have any Zener diodes at all, especially one that's 6.8 volts like this. So there's no way I can repair this circuit. I talked to my friend Brian and he doesn't care that the cassette port works on this. So I'm actually going to remove the Q1 transistor entirely. That way there's no accidental way that nine volts will get sent to the cassette motor, which I'm sure wouldn't be good for it. I am 100% positive that replacing this shorted Zener diode with a new 6.8 volt part would repair the cassette port completely on this unit. So I'm gonna leave it at that and we're gonna call this machine fixed otherwise. I'd say the last thing I'm gonna to try to fix is this poor sad plate here. It's just bent and messed up. I'm just gonna unscrew it and bend it back. There we go. It's a lot straighter. The power switch is actually <laughs> reachable. You have to push your finger in there before to get to the power switch. Power switch is now good, and it's not all loose and horrible. So here is the poor ravaged C64 mainboard looking fine once again. And here are the two bad chips from the board, where as usual, I'll be throwing them into my bin of bad parts I've taken out of computers over the years. So thanks to Sven's diagnostic harness, I know this motherboard is working well, but I decided to sit down and play some games on it anyways. That's when I discovered one final problem. There's something very wrong with the SID chip on this board. Most of the music channels that come out of it are very quiet and there's just occasional bursts of sound. Take a listen. If you've watched my previous Commodore 64 repair videos, you know I always run this Donkey Kong 
game, and the music that we're hearing here should be from Donkey Kong Country, which is a pretty great tune, but it's not sounding so good here. So let me just stick in a known good sit into this machine so I can actually play it and enjoy some games. Well, that's it for this video, and this C64 is definitely fixed. Keep in mind that I am a total novice and have never been trained in any kind of repair or electronics, so of course some of my methodologies are probably weird and not correct, but they do work for me. So if you found this video interesting or helpful in any way, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do, you can give me a thumbs down. Please put your comments and suggestions in the comment section below. And of course, you can subscribe for more videos. I put them up periodically, and there might be some other ones interesting for you in the future. Thank you very much for watching. Happy holidays and happy new year to all of my viewers. Goodbye.